Professor Scott is a highly respected and successful senior leader of large and complex institutions across public service, education and media. He joined the University of Sydney uh, at the beginning of this year, although he has a long history with the university, being a proud alumnus and holder of many degrees, which are listed here on the slide. He also holds a Master of Public Administration from the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University and honorary doctorates from the University of New South Wales and the University of Technology, Sydney. In his role as Vice Chancellor, Mark is committed to driving transformative change that will support students and staff from all backgrounds as they excel, realize their potential, solve the world's most pressing challenges and secure a prosperous future for the university. Welcome, Mark. Well, thank you very much, Professor Pond, and uh, thanks for that generous welcome. Um, and uh, wonderful to have you welcome me. You're very, so well known here at the University of Sydney and have so many uh, friends and respected colleagues here. So thank you for that warm welcome. I, I, I am at the university tonight and I want to acknowledge the traditional owners and the land in which I'm meeting today and wherever anyone is joining this call. And I want to pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. And I want to also add my voice of congratulations to those just acknowledged in the Royal Society Awards. I was heartened to see uh, five associated with the University of Sydney awarded tonight, but to all of those uh, awarded for their diligent service and their outstanding uh, academic performance, I'd like to add my congratulations as well. I, um, I want to tell the story, I suppose, of uh, the University of Sydney in the midst of COVID and what we think we've learned uh, from the COVID experience and what it means for higher education in Australia. I have a few slides that will help tell the story along the way. Um, it's a deep and complex story and I won't have time to cover it all now but in the panel discussion afterwards at Q&A uh, I'll, um, I'll be glad to engage in questions and issues that we may not get to cover and I, I note looking at the participants on the call that there are many on the call uh, who know the University of Sydney better than me and I look forward to tapping into their expertise uh, as the discussion uh, ensues. Um, I started at the University of Sydney on the 19th of July, and I tried not to take it personally that as I arrived, the university was almost departing. My arrival almost directly coincided with the major lockdown that uh, took place at the uh, university through COVID-19 last year. And I suppose I arrived, and it was almost 18 months since the university had started wrestling with the complexities of COVID. And, and I inherited a team uh, very well led, that was very adept in the challenge of keeping teaching and learning going in, Australia, in you know, really one of the world's largest universities, 70,000 students studying with us here at the University of Sydney. How do you keep research going? How do you keep teaching going? How, how do you keep your community safe in the midst of the, the global pandemic? Um, one of the things I think is evidence is, is that the university, um, that the pandemic provided an opportunity for the university to showcase itself at its absolute best. Because here at the university, obviously, we have deep expertise, deep expertise um, of, of strong disciplinary engagement over decades. And that expertise came to the fore. We have experts in viruses. We have experts in vaccines. Many of Australia's and globally recognised epidemiologists, experts in mental health and experts in uh, public health, experts in, in different factors shaping the economy. And truly COVID-19 has demonstrated that the most complex challenges that we face as a society will be challenges that need to be addressed with a full multidisciplinary engagement. And what we could see at the university is our experts coming to the fore and using their expertise to help our society deal with what had truly been unprecedented events in our lifetime. Researchers at the University of Sydney have published almost 1,600 papers as authors of co-authors over the last two years about COVID on a full gamut of issues from vaccine development to mental health and wellbeing. 
the Sydney Policy Lab's Open Society Common Purpose Task Force brought together leaders from across the nation uh, backed by our academics to help shape the debate that framed the discussion about how we go about opening up after the uh, significant lockdowns that we'd seen. Uh, our teams across the university, particularly those from the Faculty of Medicine and Health, were deeply engaged as partners with New South Wales Health on helping to sustain the health system and the hospital system. And many of our staff pivoting to clinical roles and key planning roles uh, to help um, ensure that the health system could come and stay together under the pressure that it's seen. And many of our health students were out there delivering vaccines as part of the vaccine uh, program, uh, not just in the city, but across regional New South Wales. Uh, we estimate that more than 70% of our staff in the Faculty of Medicine and Health were directly engaged in supporting New South Wales Health around the program that we had. And you'll have seen that, that many leaders in our community were involved in providing the expert commentary to provide the insight and advice necessary uh, for the public to manage their way through. Our academics were, were wonderful in providing balanced commentary, expert commentary in the media and social media. Right? I think of people like Professor Julie Leesk who helped the community understand the challenges and the barriers that we were facing in rolling out a vaccine program at scale. And the work of Professor um, Hickey, um, Ian Hickey from our Brain and Mind Centre talking about the mental health issues uh, that, that um, many have faced in our society. And in addition to that, uh, at the university, and I think there's a slide I've got that uh, shows this, uh, we took the most iconic site on the University of Sydney, our Great Hall, and we turned it into a vaccination centre where members not just of the university community but the community uh, all around us here at Sydney could come in and um, uh, uh, get vaccinated, get their second dose, and now we've got that centre operating for um, uh, now we've got that centre operating for boosters as well. So really, um, the university really engaged in this challenge of contributing to the community around uh, managing COVID and dealing with the complexities of COVID. But, but in a sense, what, what happened at the university as well is that underlying challenges were demonstrated uh, to us um, by the COVID disruption. Of course, we had to significantly change uh, the way that we were teaching, the way we were doing research, and our, re our funding model was challenged as well. Uh, universities, a university like the one behind me here, it's been running for 170 years. It can be very traditional. It can be somewhat bureaucratic. It can be a bit slow to change. Well, we had to change in remarkable uh, timeframes. Great speed to pivot. Before I arrived, to pivot to learning from home over a three-week period was truly a remarkable achievement. And I think few predicted how quickly the university would be able to do that work and how successfully it would be able to do that work. I'd say as well that COVID revealed the underlying conditions that existed in our society, and I can see this at the university, but I can also see this back in our school system as well. And the difference in uh, resources that are available for some students in more affluent backgrounds to be able to deal with COVID at a university or a school level uh, compared to students in other parts of the state and other parts of the city, I think were very, very evident as well. And as I said earlier, I think what really happened during COVID is that we demonstrated that the key to discovery of the greatest challenges we face will truly be multidisciplinary. And that multidisciplinary focus will be a key to the university of the future. Let me, I think someone's controlling uh, some slides here. So let me ask you to just uh, put them up if you can. And we'll flick to the second slide, which I think just gives you a little bit of a sense. We'll just move on to the next one. Um, and that's our vaccination center there at the Great Hall, which is open if you need your booster. So come along. Let's go to the next slide though. And it just gives you a sense of uh, some of the activities that we were uh, involved in in the last year um, as we manage COVID. Look, one of the things that we were absolutely focused on 
is the importance of the student experience. I feel desperately sorry for our students. We have some students who are going into third year this year who'll be starting with us later this month. They've had two very significant, significant years of disruption on campus. And if you think back to your time as a student, I think back to my time as a student here at Sydney, it was the experience, not just what you learned in the class, but what you're experiencing with the friends that you made, the people you didn't know, the new experiences that you encountered that was part of the university experience. And, and what we can uh, see is that that's been significantly disrupted. So, you know, what we really needed to do is to uh, do all that we can to keep the learning going and then as soon as possible to be able to open the university back up again. And after the last lockdown, I was delighted that we could open up the university again at the end of the year. It ended up, we ended up holding 67 graduation ceremonies on campus and they were truly joyful celebrations, particularly the ones that we could do um, in December. You know, clearly there's been a pivot to online learning and I suspect we've had to do that far more quickly than we would have ever been able to manage and organise COVID brought about changes that no vice chancellor would have ever been able to deliver in a similar time frame. But, but whilst the technology has been empowering and we had feedback at the Senate at the end of last year that many students have enjoyed the interactive and flexible way of engagement that online learning has brought, there's no doubt that time together is absolutely vital and that's why we're prioritising the return to campus again in coming weeks. I do think that COVID has presented a challenge for us to think through how do we use the time that we have together? Um, this is a very discerning and very discriminating cohort of students we have now. They're used to personalising their entertainment experiences. Uh, they're used to being very active online and seeking out the information that they want and the detail that they want. And I think it's fair to say, and uh, our academic leadership at the university would point out that students' tolerance for the old style lecture, that was a hallmark of when I was a student, has, has markedly diminished. And if often if those lectures had in the past had been available online or through a podcast or a video stream, students would often have not turned up. We know there's great value in the in-person learning experience. And I think what COVID has really um, challenged us to do, to think through, particularly at an undergraduate level, is not that we don't want to have students together, but if we are bringing students together with academic leadership to think through uh, challenges and to be involved in a teaching and learning environment, how do we best use that time to probe levels of understanding and to push students into deeper insight and for there to be genuine, interactive and vibrant engagement in the classroom together. And I think that's a lesson that we take from COVID. Time together is precious. How do we maximise the value of that time to maximise learning? Um, I think we feel that the um, undergraduate experience is absolutely predicated around being in person wherever possible. But I do think part of the feedback that we've got is that at a, a postgraduate level, the asynchronous learning, the flexible offerings, the balance that learning online um, allows some people to have between the pressures of work and the pressures of home um, makes us drive far more uh, assertively into thinking through how we use technology more flexibly to be able to deliver uh, graduate learning in multiple different modes with increased flexibility using technology that's now commonplace. You know, I think as we reflect about the university of the future and we reflect about what we're seeing in society now, if there was once a model that students went to school and university to learn and get knowledge which equipped them for their first job, that they would then be, um, uh, you, you know, then set on their way, that's not the model that we see now. I speak regularly at the University of Graduation not being a finishing line, but simply a milestone, and it's a key milestone on a journey of lifelong learning. So how do we as a university become true, true partners in lifelong learning? And that when a graduate from the University of Sydney remains connected with us and we are continuing to give them opportunities to learn and master new skills and new technology to equip them for a rapidly changing workplace of the future. And again, I think the focus on lifelong learning and using this technology in a dynamic way, in a flexible way, in order to deliver that for our graduates is a new uh, piece of thinking that we have on the back of COVID. The other thing that I think is clear, and you can see this by the work that's taken place across Australia, that the most complex challenges 
that we face will not be found in a single uh, university with a single group of um, academic experts, perhaps, but it will be teams of people coming together, teams within the university, but teams from outside the university as well. And we've seen that in the great work that's happened around COVID. And one of the things that I've been emphasising since I started is that the University of Sydney has to have a reputation and a deserved reputation of being great in partnerships, great at working within in a multidisciplinary way, but great at working outside as well with other universities and research institutes. And I think we've had some great examples of that in recent months. I think the Australian pilot facility to develop mRNA and RNA vaccines and other therapies that's been backed in by the state government, a partnership of all the universities in New South Wales working together is the embodiment of what we want to do. And at the University of Sydney, we look forward uh, to working extensively with other universities around Tech Central, our engagement at Westmead, our engagement in Southwestern Sydney. We see so many of these things being central uh, to partnership. Why don't I just put a spotlight on a few other matters if I can. And the next slide I think tells an important story for us. Um, Professor Eddie Holmes works at the University of Sydney and uh, Eddie Holmes became globally famous for posting the genetic information that told the story about what this new virus was, um, the coronavirus that had started to spread uh, out of China. Um, and Eddie Holmes became famous because he posted that genetic information uh, about that virus that allowed then uh, researchers around the world and uh, drug manufacturing companies to go on the path to develop the vaccines that we have uh, all um, uh, had in, in, in recent months. Uh, Eddie said something very interesting. He said, you know, he became famous and was Australian scientist of the year last year because of this. He became famous because of 30 minutes of work posting that information. But before the 30 minutes of work of information uh, came 30 years in the lab, 30 years in the lab, for that remarkable uh, moment of achievement. And I think it goes to the conversation that we really need to have as a nation around our investment in research, our investment as a society broadly in R&D, but our investment in university research and our focus on applied research, but our commitment to basic uh, research as well. Prime Minister made a significant announcement yesterday, which has been very well received about additional money to help in the, uh, in the area of applied research and universities under, under significant pressure uh, for translation of research, for commercialization of research, for research that has practical impact. And we all um, understand that. Um, you know, uh, pure science, basic science is about discovery. And many of the things that surround us in our life today are applications that have come from the breakthroughs of, of pure research about basic research, basic science. Uh, whereas applied science is about improvements on uh, old methods and the applications. And, and many of you are well versed in all of this, given your professional background and understanding. But this pattern tells the story in Australia over the last 30 years, there's been a major shift towards um, applied research with a corresponding decline in the proportion of funding that's going to basic research. And as the Prime Minister announced yesterday, this trend is already set to continue. And there's no doubt that funding to help researchers uh, cross that valley of death in research commercialization, of course, is absolutely welcome. But what is absolutely vital, if we are going to have research to apply, if we're going to have research to translate and research to commercialize in the future, we need to be making great investment in basic research now and in the infrastructure that provides basic research, and that is funding, and that is career paths for early career researchers. Um, and, and if we undertake basic, less basic research, not only uh, does that help, uh, does that hinder the trajectory towards applied research in the years and in the decades to come. It reduces the national capacity we have to understand, interpret, and apply uh, the 96% of global R&D that occurs overseas. And the COVID response through that experience of Eddie Holmes and others and the work that uh, has been done, basic research underpins applied research, and we need to be able to do that to apply to other challenges as well. And I think one of the things that COVID demonstrates is to us is that we need to get the balance right between basic research 
and applied research. And uh, basic research is not always glamorous. And basic research, uh, often the, that discovery, one does not know for a period of time where and if it will lead anywhere. But that is no reason why it needs to be underfunded or um, somewhat diluted in our national uh, effort. You, you, you do often see, and I'll, I'll speak to this again um, uh, in a minute, but often, uh, you know, the success of countries overseas in having uh, applied research and, and commercialisation of research. And that is true, and there's no doubt Australia needs to do better, but the key to it is not just a challenge to channel funding to one end rather than the other. It is to actually have significant and much broader investment in uh, R&D by government, by universities, um, and by the private sector, and by industry. I want to talk briefly and go to the next slide about um, international students, because this has been the other area that has attracted enormous focus uh, uh, during the time and the impact of COVID uh, on uh, Australian universities. You will recall, and you can see the story there from May 2020, uh, where international students were told it's time to go home. Uh, a fairly remarkable comment, I think, at the time, and a fairly remarkable comment from what we can see is what happened, uh, what happened later. I think we now can all see with the challenges to supply chains, and we can see through the economic impact of COVID at universities, that international education delivers enormous economic benefits, jobs, and, and other uh, wonderful attributes to our state and to the nation. Before the pandemic, international education was contributing more than $40 billion annually to the Australian economy, with more than half of that spent outside education uh, providers. It's our largest services export industry. It's our fourth largest export industry uh, overall. And New South Wales, largest of services export and our second export industry only to coal. And an estimation by New South Wales Treasury that it was supporting nearly 100,000 jobs. And I think the, uh, the easy dismissal of the contribution that was made, the sense it's time to go home, um, and the messaging that sent, I think, was very, very challenging uh, to this sector and very, very challenging to this work. We fundamentally believe that international students bring an enormous attribute to our university. The experience they bring, their contribution in teaching and learning, the contribution the higher degree students bring to research is absolutely uh, wonderful and enormous social benefits as well. And Australia once had great pride in the international students that it brought to Australia that you could see through the promotion of the Colombo plan. And um, I think, I hope at the end of COVID-19, we have a far greater and richer appreciation of what international students uh, are doing now. Income from international students underpins our research efforts. At the University of Sydney, uh, $700 million a year is being invested in research that is coming to us uh, from the contributions made by international students. I'm delighted to say that the borders are now open and that we're doing all that we can to bring international students back to the university. And the message, of course, has changed. Rather than go home, the Finn Review from last month, foreign students do the work and understanding of the contribution that foreign students make uh, to the economy and our operation here. And the government should not lose sight of the fact that the main purpose of international students to come here is to study is to what they will get from their experience at an Australian university and the vast majority of them will return home and be friends and partners and engage with Australia for the rest of their careers. Let me quickly speak to a few other matters and then we'll go to um, the, uh, the panel and the discussion. There's been a lot of discussion about skill shortages and if you just go to the next slide, you'll see that the Prime Minister is talking today about uh, unemployment with a three uh, in front of it. But it's very interesting, I think, when we reflect on the importance of the university sector to reflect on where that growth and employment has come over the last 30 years. And it's fundamentally come through the services sector, in healthcare and education and tourism, retail, financial services, and fundamentally in jobs that require higher level qualifications of diplomas or above. And over the next five years, the National Skills Commission predicts that 500,000 uh, or in addition of 500,000 new jobs will be created that require a bachelor's degree or higher. 
And over the last 30 years, 5 million new jobs have been created in our services industry. Five times the number of new jobs created in our goods production uh, industry, excluding agriculture, forestry and fishing. And there's an expectation that many of these new jobs will require a higher level uh, qualifications as well. And so, you know, in a way, at the University of Sydney, we're thinking that we want to be lifelong partners uh, with these people. We absolutely understand the benefit and importance of the degrees that we are offering. And a feature of the changes, particularly to the undergraduate curriculum that we have brought in recent years, see strong disciplinary knowledge coming to bear that our students know their subject areas very well, that they are mastering generic skills as well. Generic skills of creativity, um, uh, communication skills, collaborative, collaboration skills, critical thinking skills, all of which are so valued in the workplace. And it's interesting to note that of all the global universities, the University of Sydney regularly rates in the top five globally for the employability of our students. And so whilst there will be pressure on the um, skills sector and there'll be a focus on vocational education, we should not fundamentally underestimate at all the vital importance that the universities are going to continue to provide in the foundational um, education of students. Um, it is a sector under pressure, and the next slide, I think, demonstrates that. Um, I'm astonished to be able to deconstruct, in a sense, the business model of the universities now and to, to understand that uh, there is a gap between the funding the universities receive for each student and the full cost it occurs to graduate those students in large fields like medicine and dentistry and agriculture and vet science. And we offer fields, offer courses in all of those fields. And that there is a significant research funding gap as well that we need to be able to deal with here. And in 2018, Australian universities spent $6.8 billion in discretionary income on research compared to 5.3 billion that it was received, uh, specifically received from research for, from government or from uh, industry. And as I said, at the University of Sydney, we are contributing $700 million um, a year ourselves to underpin the research infrastructure uh, at the university here. It's not a healthy and sustainable ecosystem for the kind of research effort that Australia is fundamentally going to need and the R&D investment that Australia is going to need um, in the years ahead. Let me just briefly talk about this year uh, ahead and go to the next slide. We are only a fortnight away from welcoming our students back and our expectation is that we'll be trying to do as much in-person uh, teaching and learning as we can whilst trying to create an environment where despite um, COVID and, the, and Omicron, we are keeping our community safe. We're, we're delighted that more than 95% of our uh, students and our staff, we believe to be vaccinated, but we will be taking precautions following the public health guidelines uh, to keep our community as safe as possible. And we're very conscious for our students that for two years now with the shift to remote learning, the majority of students did not get the full campus experience and we want them to have the campus experience. We want to um, attach them to the university. We want them to make new friends, to have new experiences and be able to explore all that campus life has to offer. We've tripled the investment that we've made in Welcome Week to be able to provide new students with the best opportunity to make friends, to make connections that are so important to university life. Um, and we look forward to, uh, to seeing them all here in a few weeks time. As I said, we're pushing hard for um, in-person learning and we're looking to deliver the majority of classes in person in semester one, and we'll be providing details of the setup for that. We recognise that there'll be still many students who remain offshore and we'll be monitoring the Omicron situation closely uh, to try and do the best we can to get them in so they can join us on campus. So there will still be significant online learning. Um, and uh, our staff have done a great job in welcoming international students back and we have been working with other universities to charter planes and do the best we can uh, to bring students back in and work with us uh, over uh, um, uh, once university starts. The other thing that we're doing at the university this year is we are working on our 10-year strategy. 
uh, thinking through what do we want to be to be a truly world-class university, one of the great global universities by 2032. And beyond 2032, we look out to 2050 when the University of Sydney will turn 200. And part of our important strategic work that will engage all our community is to think through the things we need to be doing to improve the student experience, to lift the research um, outcomes, to develop those capabilities that we know we're going to need to be truly collaborative, to be truly multidisciplinary, to be great at working internally together as one university and strong in partnership with other institutions um, uh, outside as well. So it's a busy and vibrant time ahead. Um, I think there's a great excitement about the prospect of our students being back and for us finding a way uh, to have a more traditional engagement in the university. I want to pay tribute to our staff who've worked so hard to keep research and teaching going um, uh, over the past two years, and we're optimistic about the year ahead. I'm going to pause there. There's, there's lots more, particularly around research infrastructure and R&D um, and settings of government policy and the like that we might get into, but I'll leave it in the hands of the panel and I'll leave it in the hands of the Q&A. Thank you very much indeed, Vice-Chancellor. That was indeed uh, quite a um, speedy way through, through what has been an enormous amount of change. And as you say, accelerated change going in directions that we'll all go. We decided tonight, since we're so sad not to be able to be all together, that we would try and reproduce faces. So we're having a, a panel discussion. Can I please encourage those in the audience who are not on the panel to add their questions to the Q&A, and I'll try and come to them later. I, I wanted to start um, with a question which is really not so much a dilemma, but the tension that there is between training, training and education, between developing skills and employability. But I wanted to do it because I was very struck by the way that you focused on the student experience from the student's perspective. The graduate premium, the lift to future income for completing a, a degree has in fact diminished greatly. And of course, it's gonna depend on what course you do and what, where you do it, but it's becoming very much less noticeable in, in countries like the United Kingdom at places vanishingly small. So we can't, students can't assume that having a degree is going to increase their income. You noted that there's a labour shortage coming up, a skills shortage, but not necessarily in areas that we in the university sector are, are fitting our students for. You talked about the new world of work. Ten years ago, I had a colleague at my university in Bath who, who wrote a, a piece that was very widely covered all over the world about the ten new jobs that were going to be around that were not yet there. Now, all of them are now jobs that you see ads for. One of them, for instance, was data ethicist. Those jobs are existing, but we don't know where we're going to go next. UTS did a survey of its students and found 40% of them had no intention of trying, of being employed. They wanted to, to launch and scale their own companies. Yeah. So the employment space is different. But from the other perspective, students, as you say, they don't come just to get a, a job ticket. They come to meet friends, to gain prestige, to network and to learn to think. And you know, we're all familiar and probably most of us went to university at the time where that liberal arts model, which of course included the sciences of developing citizens, to use, to use Dewey's phrase, was the role of the university. It was not instrumental, the university's role. As I pointed out, data ethics involves the sort of being a good data ethicist you can't do just because you're good at IT. You're going to need to understand ethics. You're going to need that rigorous training in philosophy. So I, I, I wonder if you could just explore a little bit that tension between those two sides of the universities. Yeah, yeah what, what a, a fabulous, uh, fabulous question and, and articulation of the challenge, uh, Christina. I, I think... 
It was very interesting. I, I, I was watching closely the debate on the job ready graduates um, reform that the government introduced, and Michael Spence at Sydney uh, was at, at the forefront of some criticisms of that. And I thought, I thought it did, um, you know, in a sense, articulate some of the confusion in the public discourse around this. I mean, I, I don't think universities have ever, and I don't think we now, focus on educating our students for the first job they get after graduation. And uh, we educate them to have the, the deep knowledge and the skills and the capabilities to be able to develop careers and make a contribution. I think part of the challenge we have in doing that now is that the nature of work is changing so quickly, the nature of technology is changing so quickly, that it's not idle speculation to suggest that many of our students here today will have jobs that we have not heard of using technology they have not heard of. And every now and again, if I want to pause, I think that some of the students who start with us next, next week will be um, in the workforce um, through the 2080s. You know, they have a long and rapid and rapidly fast changing world to which to encounter. So in a sense, we are equipping them to deal with that change. I think deep disciplinary knowledge strong workplace capabilities, but, but more than anything, the capability of being lifelong learners. We are equipping them to be learners for the rest of their lives. And I think we need to um, positively and assertively um, articulate that responsibility. I mean, I, I, I think some of the disparagement that you've heard in, in some areas around the arts degree fundamentally misses the point. Uh, and, and the point is that our arts, do, our arts graduates have fabulous employment track records because they are getting precise of the capabilities that employers want. And you're, so, you're, you're being one of them, I, I think. I, exactly right. Exhibit A. Um, you know, that, that really the things that you learn in the Masters in an arts degree, a deep understanding, but also uh, writing skills, listening skills, creativity, collaboration, the range of those capabilities are so valued by employers. Uh, and, and I think um, so we need to uh, strongly stand up for, um, I think, the great virtues of um, the classic liberal arts education that you, um, that you articulate. But I think our students do want to be equipped for uh, the workplace and I think one of the things that we are doing all across the university is deep partnerships with employers, uh, programs that get students out in the workplace and engaging in real problem solving and real engagement. I think we need to be nimble and responsive and, and I think to pick up the very first point you made, you know, you know, one piece of heresy, occasionally I would ask the question when I started, do we think of students as customers? Very interesting. Um, I'm told, no, 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 don't, don't say that. That language doesn't play well. But it's an interesting challenge for us, I think. You know, I think you go back 60, 70 years, students were customers. They were more like serfs. You know, there was a sense that they were lucky to be there, but all the power and the authority was with the institution and those who'd been at the institution for a long period of time. But I, I feel an immense responsibility to our students they aren't just paying significant money. You know, the degree that I got into at the University of Sydney was free. Students who got into it last week and got that offer, they're going to pay $70,000 for that degree. What do we owe them? And I think we don't just owe them money and a valuable, enriching, transforming experience for the money. They are giving us three, four, five years of their life, the most wonderful, valuable, exciting time of their life. We owe them a fully enriching and fulfilling experience as part of that too. And so I want to be very much known. I want the university to be quite obsessed about that transformational student experience that university life should be. Thank, thank you very much. I might, we'll come back to some of those issues a bit more. Can I just remind people that if they've got questions that they want me to relay, can they put them in the Q&A, not in the chat? Um, I think perhaps I, I would like to shift just a little bit to some of the questions around research. You, yeah. you yourself managed um, remarkably well uh, mediating, as it were, between government and, and, and the public broadcaster, that public mm. sphere space. You've already come out quite 
strongly on the issue of interference in ARC grants. And you've just commented on the government's university research commercialization plan. I mean, I don't think any vice chancellor could say anything but whoopee if there's going to be a lot of money there. But there's an yeah. interesting um, uh, article about this that, that Roy Green has, has came out in the Fin Review today, where he said that the, the plan was welcome but lacking a coherent institutional policy framework. Yeah. When I was in the UK, they, they introduced the um, Innovate UK and the UK Research and Innovation, which was about creating an innovation ecosystem. And I if you can describe how you think we, we can work with government to produce those sorts of results, perhaps, we, you know, for instance, with your scholarships. I think I think it's it's a, a critical question, and, and so what, what I can see at the moment in in government policy making around higher education is some immediate challenges and immediate interventions that try and address that issue. So, for example, job ready graduates that I referenced earlier, there was a desire to get more students studying science, more students studying agriculture. So, an intervention that targets that. I think similarly around. Um, research, yes, we want more commercialisation, more applied research, so funding goes to that. But I think you've got to look at the whole ecosystem. And the whole ecosystem does not just talk about governments funding research at universities, but how much R&D is business putting in, what incentives do business have to partner with universities. We need a collaborative approach to lift our overall investment in R&D in Australia. That's the starting point. The question is where the money is allocated, but fundamentally, Australia are cellar dwellers in the OECD when it comes to investment in R&D, which is extraordinary when you think that the future of this country won't be what we dig up out of the ground, but it will be the creativity and ingenuity of the people that walk the land. And so, you know, it was once said we wanted to be a clever country. At the moment, we are not making the overall investment in R&D. So I think the first question is how much do we spend and then how you bring about a genuine collaborative effort uh, of government and universities and research institutes and industry partners to develop key research missions on the big challenges that we face as a uh, society. And we need to increase our R&D investment and our R&D intensity. Um, I think there are real challenges that we've got here in contrast to the US and the UK. We don't fund the full economic costs of university research. Uh, it's, 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 it's like funding parliament, but you're only going to fund the salaries of the politicians. No, no one else who works there, no upkeep of the building, nothing else, because we only, we only fund, the only thing that happens in government is the salaries of politicians. It simply doesn't work. And we need to really pursue, I think, longer term policies that look at that whole ecosystem. And I, I would encourage a more holistic review of the pattern and pathway of R&D spending in partnership across all Australian sectors as a key policy undertaking that we now need to, that we now need to make. And, and part of that, I think, will be looking at the balance between basic research and applied research. We all understand the importance of applied research, but you've got to have something to apply. And the only way you do that is by investing in basic research now. And we need to we need to recalibrate that mix. I think that, that that's interesting because Luke Cornish had a question exactly um, using language, saying, "What did you think the ideal balance is between uh, yeah. uh, and, and applied research?" And I think you're saying it, that's something we have to work out. Yeah, I, and I, I was looking at some work done by one of our deans today, and he was speculating that um, it it is. You know, I, I think I accept the total dollars spent on applied research um, has been too low, but the long-term pattern to fund applied research out of funding that was once in basic research is not the answer either. All right. Well, look, I've got one more quick question. I think that one of the lessons that we've learnt from the mess around international students. I, I suspect that we've needed to learn the lesson that it's very important that we don't allow international students to be in ghettos. I think we've 
both in coarse ghettos and in, in yeah. areas where live. And I think that your vision that the international students should be part of our community and create the global networks all of our students will need to survive is very good. But how are you going to do it? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I think um, we, uh, can I start in national students? I'm really struck at how resilient and persistent they've been. They've kept studying online. In fact, the University of Sydney has had a um, uh, surprising uh, increase in certain areas of international students and our numbers are holding up very well for 2022 as well. I think, I think we don't immediately have the answer to that question. That's something we need to look at. One of the questions I think we'll be looking at as part of our strategy is what is the share of total mix of international students versus domestic students? I should say, you know, when, again, coming into the sector, one of the things that surprised me, I, I, I was... Um, I was thinking of the old line of Casablanca. All of a sudden, people were shocked, shocked to discover that there were international students all across Australian universities. When I was a student here, 90% of the funding of the university came from the federal government. Now it's 30%. And there's been a bipartisan agreement that international students will deliver that funding stream. They value an Australian education. It's a wonderful part of the public diplomacy that we offer, that they go back friends and supporters of Australia. But we do need to do a better job in making sure their experience here is rich and diverse. Um, and we are thinking through our um, mix of international students in different uh, courses, how we engage them more in the social engagement of the university and how we find them the support they need to really be able to flourish here. And I think that'll be an important focus of our strategy this year. Great. I'm going to hand to Judith now. Oh, just hand over? Okay. Yes. Am I ready? Okay, good. Mark, I wish we were back at university and could talk about all of this till two in the morning because you've <laughs> raised so many topics of all different sorts, but I'm going to try to stick to the question that I brought with me. And it springs from your title, Transformational Change. Yes continually needed, but plus a change. Some things remain the same and need to be learned, understood, reinterpreted by each new generation. Understanding the nature of our humanity is critical, especially with the changing nature of work, which is already addressed. But I remind us that AI in particular, which will be a part of our future, absolutely depends that we understand the nature of human beings qua human beings. What distinguishes us, however, as human beings? I'm hearing feedback. Is everybody else hearing feedback? Yeah. I don't know what that's from. It's distracting, I'm sorry. Um, when I began university, my anthropology textbook was Man the Toolmaker. Then Betty the Crow taught us that animals also make tools. So then it was man, the user of language. Now we know that birds, whales, and other animals also use language, even some symbolic language. So the question remains, what truly distinguishes us as human beings? Could it be that we alone among the species can study ourselves self-reflectively through science, history, philosophy, literature, art, to name a few of the departments of our universities. Enough rhetorical questions. Here's one based on those, but for you, Mark. Is furthering understanding of ourselves and our society not the essential purpose of universities that distinguishes them from vocational training? How can we defend the arts and the proper teaching of science and the fruitful conducting of research uh, that those outside the university who wish to use universities as a means for quite contrary political and economic ends promote without any respect to this essential purpose of the university. Yeah, it's so, <laughs> we, we need till two in the morning, uh, Judith, to attack all of that. Um, but let me, um, let me have a go. I absolutely understand what you're saying and appreciate and endorse that. I think part of the, but right at the end is the, 
We understand that that is a key enduring function of the university, that we're not just here to equip students to get a job six weeks after graduation, that it's much deeper and tr more transformational experience for them that should profoundly shape who they are and how they live the rest of their lives and the quality of the contribution they can make to their communities and to this nation and engaging in the great pressing problems and challenges that we face together. I think in a way, part of the challenge the sector has is the sector has not done a good enough job in really explaining what happens here and the great benefit of what happens here to the public good and the common good. And that's why I think COVID was a wonderful opportunity for us that I think we took, that our deep experts who had been toiling away in anonymity for decades, their moment came and we valued the fact that they had studied viruses so closely that they understood vaccine rollouts all around the world. They, they could tell us what the impact of shutdowns and isolation would have on mental health. And we paid attention to their expertise and we followed their advice and we were safer as a community together. So the great public benefit of the work that happens here, the research and the expertise that happens here, we need to tell that story more systematically and, and better. I think in a way as well, I, I, I think, in a, you know, universities generate envy at times from people outside. How wonderful it would be to be a researcher pursuing your own interests. How wonderful it would be to be a student who could just spend their days at the university and who'll graduate and do well. We need to explain more deeply the benefits to the community, not just from the research, but the benefits that accrue from the richness of the contribution that will be made from the students who have that kind of experience. And I think we have allowed a vacuum there that has been filled by a more um, narrow and dismissive view of the university. And, and as a sector, we haven't defended ourselves. And as university leaders, we probably haven't been as strongly out there ourselves and challenged, I think, um, some of the false perceptions that exist on the value and the contribution of the university. One of the lines I've, I'm using here and talking about, and other university leaders talk about it too, is that we want to be an elite, but not an elitist university. We want to be absolutely outstanding in our standards and our commitment to excellence and the quality of research. And we want our research that takes place here to have global impact. But we don't want to be an elitist university. We want to be a place that um, talented people can come no matter you know where they've been to school, no matter what suburb they're from, no matter what their family background is, and a place of access for the talented to come here and really maximise uh, what it is they offer and what it is that they bring. And so again, I think if we can explain the impact of the excellence, but make it clear that our doors are open to any person with the talent to flourish here, then I think that's an important part of the story that we need to tell well as to well. And I just follow up a little bit, Christy, please. Mark, one of the big influences on universities is the student intake. Yeah. I would just like to call attention to a very good question from um, Ken Dawson in the chat line, Christy. Uh, an excellent question, one that I could absolutely uh, uh, corroborate about how students view university. Um, what can the university do to help students who are coming up to university to understand better what the university is about and for whom it's suitable? We've idolized university so that everybody wants to go, whether it's the best choice for them or not. And they don't understand what that choice ought to be based on and when they sometimes can actually be better fitted somewhere else, that all yeah. tertiary education is valuable. Um, and there's something very particular about the value of a university education it needs a certain kind of student. Yeah. Um, again, it's a deep question. Um, one of the challenges I think we've got in New South Wales and other places around the country as well. You know, you know this better than anyone, Judith, given your background, but you know, the New South Wales HSC was really designed for students to go to university. And when it was first sat in 1967, only 20% of the students had started school were staying on to do the HSC. Now it's close to 80%. 
The HSC fundamentally hasn't changed with that different cohort. And, you know, Peter Shergold and others, David Gonski did an important report. Um, and uh, Peter's done a lot of work on vocational education. And, and there is that sense that I think vocational education in schools needs to be better and um, to open up more pathways to vocational education, because there are many great careers that come from vocational education. And we need to actually, through the school system, be, to be creating more opportunities for applied learning. So there isn't actually this streaming process that takes place for the academically more able on a university pathway and those who don't aspire to university doing different courses. We need to be able to mix that up far more as you see in systems more like um, Germany. And then I think the a key point, and again, picked up in the report that uh, Peter Shergold and David Gonski did, an absolute overhaul of careers education um, in our schools to really be able to inform young people on the array of choices that are available and um, to help inform them and sharpen their decision-making options. Um, there are some brilliant careers teachers in our schools. Uh, but they're not everywhere and not every student has access to one. And in too many places, they are simply the distributors of materials that are sent out from places like the University of Sydney. And our students deserve better insight and better assistance in making that most vital decision that they'll need to make at a young age. So um, there's lots more that we need to do on that. There's quite a nice question from Alistair Walker here saying uh, that your presentation reminded him of of uh, 21st century skills of creativity, collaboration, agility, entrepreneurship. Will these skills play any greater role in selecting students to attend yeah. university? What a great question. Um, the tyranny of the ATAR, uh, we can talk about that for a while. I mean, the ATAR is designed to rank students and Sydney still um, uses the ATAR quite extensively, probably more extensively than in the other university. And it's not a bad predictor of the future success of students broadly. I mean, it's used at a very precise level of cutoffs of some courses, but broadly the ATAR is as good a predictor as we've found for success in the university sector. I think the, I understand the aspiration behind the question, the challenges in the execution. I was interested when I was running the New South Wales school system to speak of to principles of some of our most disadvantaged students in our most disadvantaged schools. And much to my surprise, they were more supportive of the ATAR than I would have expected. Because they said, once you get into something else, once you start saying, well, bring me your portfolio and show me your work experience and, um, and use a whole lot of other criteria, then the social capital of the child and the socioeconomic background of the child absolutely comes to bear on the creation of that portfolio and the richness of their extracurricular material experiences. And you go down the line of a place like Harvard, that even though they've poured money into scholarships and every, everything else, when they come to select, they're still disproportionately drawing from the top 2% socioeconomically in the country. And so it's how you would have a system beyond an ATAR that was manageable and affordable, but somehow didn't skew even greater, uh, again, in, in the pendulum against uh, students who already are, are suffering significantly from inequality that obviously exists within our education system. The challenge is how you do it. Okay, I'm gonna move on to A.D. Uh, Patterson. From Thank the you very much, uh, Christine. <laughs> Hi, Mark. We, we haven't met, but it's good to meet this way. And, and thank you for an awesome uh, presentation about your vision for the university. I want to do to kind of dig a little bit back into hindsight, not just foresight. Um, you know, uh, the university is on Gadigal land. Uh, Gadigal land is land from which people were dispossessed and which uh, was a loss for those communities, for their traditions, for their knowledge, and so on. And I wonder how a reflection not just on the future of the university, but a deeper reflection um, of hindsight might be useful to your tenure and to, in fact, the university community to reflect on how things could have been better. You yeah. know, we talk about elites, but um, elites sometimes self-select. Uh, maybe sometimes disadvantage is, a, is an advantage when it comes into the university setting because it challenges the paradigms the challenges of the setting which we are. 
And so my question is, how does the university not seem like a spaceship which has landed in Sydney, but which is embedded in the Sydney basin and which is embedded and articulates things about the history that are uncomfortable so that we can also then with foresight have a better future where yeah. disadvantage might become advantage, where exclusion might become participation, where um, the isolation of those ideas that seem to be so unattractive now, um, they liberated, I think, as Judith was saying, is we need some of the other ideas that are less valued now to be amplified by the university. So my question is, don't we need some hindsight uh, in order to have better foresight as you plan your tenure? Great question. Um, I want to pay tribute to some folks at the university. I think Michael Spence, my predecessor, and Linda Hutchinson, the Chancellor, Lisa Jackson Pulver, who's a Deputy Vice Chancellor of the University. Uh, a document was released uh, early last year, One Sydney, Many People, and I think it addresses precisely the issues that you identify. We've been here for 170 years. Teaching and learning has been taking place on the lands in which we operate for 60,000 years. Um, you know, the work that we have done, our experts have done, have tried to identify, you know, in a sense, what happened in this space that we now uh, occupy. And I think there are numbers of things that emerge from the questions that you raise at a very fundamental level. We want um, wide open doors of this university to all students and students from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. We need to ensure that we have the right pathways of support to allow as many in here who could flourish here as we could possibly identify and support and to make sure that their experience here is rich and engaging and that they're making a vibrant contribution to university life and we are all learning from their experience and we're doing a lot of work on that we've reopened the Gadigal we've opened the Gadigal Centre which is a support centre for those students and similarly um, employing Aboriginal staff uh, we are not at a level of having Aboriginal staff here to make the contribution that you that you want and need for them to make yet and we've got to ask ourselves questions why but then i think it goes to the richness of learning i mean i i've seen in my experience running the school system the power of having aboriginal elders in the aboriginal community teaching uh, traditional science to students or explaining the science curriculum through the lens of traditional stories and understanding being absolutely powerful and transformational one of the most moving experiences i had as secretary of the department was going to a high school up the north coast where the year seven students weren't speaking French and German, the languages that I learned when I was at school, but they were learning the local Aboriginal language and the local Aboriginal language was being learned by all the students at that school, taught by the Aboriginal elders. So culturally rich, educationally sound, engaging the expertise and the wisdom of the elders and the players. So part of One Sydney Many People is to go, encouraging us to go back and interrogate the curriculum and what we are teaching. Um, in the insight, with the insight and experience and understanding of, of elders and, and um, our understanding of Aboriginal history and uh, the, the understanding of science that comes from Aboriginal people and to embed that. We're looking at naming protocols around the university to constantly be reminded of the history that's taken place exceeding well back beyond you know, 1850 when we were founded. I think you'll find um, a lot of wrestling with the complexities and the issues that you raise um, uh, are found in one Sydney, uh, many people. And I think part of what we want to do as well is to be at the forefront of the public debate and engagement around the policy challenges that we now face to ensure um, a vibrant and prosperous um, sharing of modern Australia between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and all other citizens of this nation. I think we now will turn to Steve. And perhaps Thanks, Christina. Um, Mark, it struck me uh, that you view online learning as a key element of where to next for universities. And one consequence, not the only one, but one consequence of the pivot the rapid pivot to online learning is that it brings university offerings into a very starkly into a global marketplace in a way that, that really hasn't been as, as, as obvious before. So with that as background, I'm wondering if you see it as important that universities 
invest scarce resources into making their online offerings distinctive yeah as opposed to simply outsourcing to to the best yeah what a great question um back um oh, 15 years ago i suppose when my hair was less gray than it is today i was running the abc I'd, I'd often been invited to speak to groups of vice chancellors about what we were seeing in the media sector and the reality was when i was a student here at the university of sydney handful of television stations, handful of radio stations, all developed in the city, you know, local newspapers. You know, I, I, never, I never thought I could watch the BBC or read the New York Times. It was a closed market. There was an oligopoly of providers. They were very wealthy and very successful. And I said to them, does that model remind you of anything? Where there are closed markets providing information to kind of captive communities. Well, that's very similar to an education model now. I think um, there will be challenges to us from those who will try and come into our market and will pick off lucrative sections of it and will say, we can package information to you in a meaningful way that is very tailored to your needs and very personalised. We're an era of personalised content. And some of those that will come and do that will be ed tech firms who are brilliant at taking information and packaging it and delivering it to meet local needs. And the other challenge for us will be the greater presence of those great global brands. And just like the Sydney Morning Herald is competing with the New York Times and the Washington Post and the, and the Guardian in London, so in case possibly we will be competing with Harvard and Stanford and Oxford and Cambridge and, and the great global universities. So um, I think we would be at peril if we were in denial of that challenge. I think the other thing that we can see in picking up on what you were saying, our students will be discerning consumers. They are very tech savvy. They are very confident around screens. They are bombarded by content that is very sophisticated or very agile or very tailored to their needs. So we need to think through how we play in that space. I don't think though, it's simply a case of allocating scarce resources. There'll be less for everything else. I think the market will grow on the back of, of what is required. Because just like the media market is far greater than it was a decade or so ago, the market grows. And the market that could grow significantly for us is to be the partners in lifelong learning. To be the partners in lifelong learning. That if you graduate, you are going to have to keep mastering the new because the world is going to be changing on you very quickly. So how do we partner with industry to keep uh, their employees up to speed. How do we keep our business or our computer science graduates up to speed with the latest breakthrough in technology? And then I think part of your, your question, Stephen, really is a question about what will be the local advantage there? What benefits us being able to develop that material in Sydney for those who are studying in Sydney and working in Sydney? And where does the competitive advantage comes, come there? Um, I think there is an interesting element that says whilst, if you look at media, whilst there are vast global markets that have been created, there are increasingly strong local markets or the, or the market breaks into community. You know, community is the organising principle around so much media. So what community do we need to create? And I've reflected uh, to our team here that, you know, I graduated with two degrees from Sydney University. I didn't hear much from the university in the years that, that followed. I graduated from Harvard. They started asking me for money when I was halfway through the course. They, you know, they, they, they kind of messaged me every week. Um, and, and that's why Harvard has $50 billion US in trust. But, but we need to stick really close to our graduates now to understand their needs well, to be nimble and agile, to be able to respond to them and to keep in partnership. And again, not wanting to go back to the customer word, but I will. But if we were a business, we'd think a graduate is a lifelong customer. We need to keep close to them. We need to understand them. We need to meet their needs. We need to be agile. And if we do that, that's a, that's a new market that we can really grow rather than a cannibalization of something else. So um, I don't think it's a binary trade-off. I, I think it's one of the great strategic challenges that we face. There are great similarities, I think, to what I can see facing this sector than I saw when I was working firstly in newspapers and then in broadcasting. Um, 
One of the lines I used to use a bit was from the Italian novel, The Leopard, which says, if we want things to remain the way they are, things will have to change. If we want things to remain the way they are, things will have to change. And so if we want to be the great centre in this city and in this nation of teaching and learning and engaging with students and preparing them for a lifeline, lifetime of mastery in whatever environment that they're in, if we want to continue to do that, as we've done for 170 years, then we will have to change. And part of the change will be wrestling with the issues you raise. And to be in denial that those changes will impact on us, then you just join all those companies we've all heard so much about. You know, you become the Kodak of higher education. Thanks, Mark. Vice Chancellor, there are so many more questions, multidisciplinarity, issues about community outreach, uh, and so on, but I think there couldn't be a better note on which to finish than, um, than the leopard. And, and so I'm going to hand over to Judith for the, for the thanks. Well, it's a great honor to be able to thank you tonight, Mark, for all the value that you've given us in looking at the universities, your university's experience in overcoming COVID and how it was such an induction for you into your new job. I certainly did think about you at the time. It was a very dramatic time for all of us. And I think you've recalled that beautifully as a beginning for us and uh, pointing out what a catalyst it is for many of the changes that perhaps were going to have to happen anyway, some of them, and to see how we would survive through that period of time as difficult as it was. You raised a lot of interesting issues for us to think about, international issues, uh, the nature of work, I think a very important one, how universities contribute to the common good, I would almost say are the foundation of the common good in so many different ways. Uh, career education in schools is a very important topic that, that uh, interrelates was another one you brought up, which I think needs to be explored by us a lot more. For me, a particularly important item was bringing in the idea of the indigenous education, not the education of indigenous people in this case, but for a change, the really important point about what our indigenous fellow citizens contribute to the education of all of us and what an opportunity we're missing very much of the time. So that was a particularly good point as far as I was concerned. I can see that your university in particular, but Australian universities in, in general have a very rich future in front of them. And I wish you well in making Sydney University a great global university by 2032. If it hasn't already happened, I suspect it will. Thank you very much for starting our educational year with so many topics and such a multifaceted view of university education in Australia, I think made all the more interesting because there's a sense in which you're a novice at it still. And I think those fresh eyes see problems, see tradition, see history in a very fresh way. And that can promote a very exciting future. Thank you for taking the time to prepare and to spend with us and for giving us so many exciting thoughts to improve our view of transformational change in our universities. We, everybody will be joining me in applauding you now. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Judith. Okay, thank you, Christian. Thank you, Mark. And congratulations, Mark. You've held a very large audience for the duration of your presentation and the Q&A. 
larger than it would have been had we held this meeting face to face. So well done. So it's my uh, role to close the 1300th Ordinary General Meeting. In addition to congratulating Mark, I congratulate again the uh, winners of our 2021 awards. And uh, soon after this meeting, the full details of their biographies and achievements will be published on the Royal Society of New South Wales website. So please join me as I close the meeting in congratulating Mark and all of the award, award uh, recipients for 2021. Thank you all. Good night.